Good morning, friends. Steve from Southern Illinois here. It's a beautiful fall day and uh, temperatures are dropping. Jackets are coming out of the closets. When I got back from Missouri this week, um, yeah, COVID is still here. My doctors in the ER are still seeing cases, still having to transfer patients because they're too sick for, for our small hospital. But we're only seeing one or two of those people a day instead of 10 or more. So things are improving a little bit. Prudence is still called for, but some of the pressure is off of the health system at least. So let's start with a story today. This one happened probably 30 years ago. I don't know. Uh, early in our time here in Fairfield. Gardening has always been a passion of mine. Um, can't really remember a time when I didn't have a garden in our yard. And I tend to not want to use chemicals, whether it be pesticides or fertilizer. And uh, so I'm in a constant quest for ways to feed my garden. And at this time, uh, John Lopes, a physician's assistant, had just joined me and he and his wife uh, lived out in the countryside. She had a passion for horses. I had a passion for gardening. I wanted manure for my garden and the only other sources of manure that I've been able to find around here are horse racing establishments and what I get from them is more straw than it is manure. So uh, when Debbie offered me some of the byproducts uh, that her horses had raised through had produced through the winter I jumped at the chance problem is I've never owned a pickup my job my work just doesn't call for it um, so John offered to lend me his pickup to haul the manure and he had a front end loader out on the farm and so he loaded the manure into the pickup and I drove it over here to my house and backed it up to my garden and started unloading it and <clears throat> got the manure out of the bed of the pickup and jumped down to drive it out and notice that the ground was not nearly as far away as it had been when I climbed up into the pickup. Turned out <clears throat> that I had a soft spot in my garden and um, yeah the wheels had sunk down in so my dad had taught me how to get a, get a, a vehicle unstuck and uh, First, I gently tried to edge it out. That didn't work, so I dug out in front of the wheels and tried to go up the incline. That didn't work. In fact, it dug itself in more. So I got some bricks and put them down, had some scrap bricks from a construction project, and put them down and put some wood on top of it. and. pickup just kept sinking down further and further and further and two hours later when my neighbors were coming home from work they see me out here uh, in my yard uh, with this pickup stuck and you know by now the belly of the bed is and uh, the belly of the pickup is just down in the mud I have dug and dug and dug and dug and they came over and, <clears throat> and by now I had four or five of my neighbors you know helping me and you know we dug and we dug and that didn't work so 
One of them went home and got his four-wheel drive pickup. He was going to pull us out. And he got a chain and he hooked it up to the, to, uh, under the, the front of the pickup. And <clears throat> the re one of us, I got in the pickup and, uh, you know, I'm, dr I'm ready to drive out. And he starts pulling and his wheels start spinning and mud starts flying everywhere. And then all of a sudden, crack! The chain broke flipped back and hit the windshield and the windshield in front of me cracked. Oh man, a borrowed truck. Now I've cracked the windshield. It's stuck and we still can't get it out. And uh, The guys and I are standing around there trying to figure out what to do in this predicament. And another neighbor walks over and he looks at me and he said, is this a four-wheel drive? He said, I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, did you connect the hubs? And I was like, what are you talking about? I pushed the switch inside that said four-wheel drive. So he went to the front tires and there was this little I don't know even what to call it, but he engaged the hubs. He said, now try it. So I hopped into the vehicle and, yeah, effortlessly drove it out of the mud. One of the most enlightening and humiliating episodes in my life as a man. Um, my neighbors have never given me grief about that, but in my mind I can always hear them sneak, snickering about Steve and his ignorance of four-wheel drive vehicles. Sorry, my papers blew off here. Have you ever borrowed something or been entrusted with something? and ha have the windshield crack. Stewardship is a theme that flows through the Bible from beginning to end. Here in America today we don't talk about stewards very much. It's a holdover from days gone by when the rich would entrust their goods to a steward who was responsible for caring for them and preserving them. In the Bible, in Genesis uh, chapter 1, we have the story of creation and man's, when man is created, God says, let him have dominion over all of nature let him be the steward of nature. And in Genesis 2, it defines what that was. A man was given the responsibility for caring for nature. The psalmists, uh, Psalms 24 is a good example. It starts out, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God created, he made everything and it belongs to him. That is the touchstone of stewardship in the Bible. That is the element of spirituality that was part of the spiritual lives of the people in the Bible. That God, the Creator, owned everything and only delegated responsibility for caring for it to mankind. This is a radically different concept than ownership, private ownership that is the bedrock of capitalistic societies, at least here in the West. Okay. When you own something, it's legitimate for you to use it to dominate it, to exploit it, however you want to. 
But when you are the steward for something, when something has precious has been entrusted into your care, then it's to be treasured, it's to be preserved, it's to be nurtured. It's a completely different relationship. In the Old Testament, this concept of stewardship is translated directly into a system of tithes and offerings. Tithes, one-tenth of what was produced in the fields, was to be returned, not paid, returned to the Lord who had given it. God created and made and entrusted to us. And so one-tenth of what we produced was to be returned to him. In addition, the Old Testament talks about free will offerings, thank offerings. Offerings expressing our thankfulness to God for what has been given. So these two concepts, returning what is the Lord's and praising him by giving above and beyond that were bedrock to the spiritual lives of the people in the Old Testament and are, are, is mentioned repeatedly in the New Testament. So how has this played out in my life? Well, as a child, I was taught uh, to return a tithe and an offering. So I can still remember when I got my first allowance. Now, allowance in our household was tied to completing the assigned chores. So it was more akin to a salary than an allowance. If we didn't do our chores, we didn't get our allowance. Our allowance was 10 cents. Now, I'm convinced that that, that was an intentional act on the part of my parents because they always gave us 10 pennies. And one penny went into our tithe, and one penny went into our offering. We had these little, little metal buckets that we would put our pennies in. And one was labeled offering, and one was labeled tithe. And when we went to church each week, we took our tithe and our offering, and we put it into the offering um, bucket. So even as a child, I was taught that the principles of stewardship in terms of returning to the Lord a tithe and giving a thank offering. Now, that, that has continued to this day. Okay, when I was in college and uh, in medical school and living on a minimum wage job, still returned my tithes and offerings it was not it was not abnormal for me because that was the way my life had been constructed now if you've not grown up returning tithes and offerings this may feel intrusive to you because you have built your life around using 100% of what you earn yourself Whereas the concept of stewardship, as it was expressed in the people whose lives we read about in the Bible, only 80% of what was earned was thought of as belonging to the person. So it didn't matter whether I was on a minimum wage income or after my education had been completed and I started working as a doctor, had more at hand, I still carried forward the same principles, except that now the thank offerings, I had more to be thankful for. And so rather than 10%, more was given. Vivian and I have always designed our lives around it. Living within our means mean Living within your means means 
designing your life expectations around what you earn. And we designed ours around this principle. But as I matured, I realized that stewardship involves much more than money. I've been entrusted with much more than money. Time, talent, possessions, relationships. Boy, when I realized that every relationship in my life was a gift that had been given and that I was entrusted with preserving and nurturing it, that was a radical change for me, okay? Um, seen through this lens, the concept that the man is the head of the household uh, takes on a radically new life. I'm not called to dominate and control my family, my wife or my children. Leading a family is more about leading an ex exemplary life inspiring, modeling, than it is about commanding obedience. Now, as when children are young, we do give them rules. We do have responsibility for training. But that is not the end of leadership. That's, that's what we do for children. Okay? The goal of leadership is to inspire them to adopt your life. When we use anger and threat of violence or threat of punishment, withdrawal of love, withdrawal of gifts to control our families, we reveal that we don't understand how God deals with us or what he expects of us as his sons and daughters. Obedience that does not come from respect and admiration is a result of oppression. And when we have to use the power of command in our families, it is a sure sign that we have failed in our the living of our lives in a manner that inspires admiration from our ch wives and children. Examples should always precede instruction, which should always precede direction or command. Now, this perspective, in turn, has changed how I look at witnessing and evangelism. If my life does not lead people to respect and admire me, wanting to emulate me, wanting to understand why I live my life the way I do, then my words are meaningless. If you're convinced by my words and you know nothing about my life, and my influence is weak. If you know what I believe, but not how I live, what have I really revealed to you? It's superficial. Not everyone is given the gift of preaching, and not everyone should aspire to teaching. The Bible is clear on that. Not all of us are sent to speak the word, but all of us are called to honor God in our lives by the way we live. If we live our lives as a sacred trust extended to us by our Creator, it will be radically different than if we think of everything that we possess or that comes within our control as being ours to use. So to me, what I do here on Sabbath 
is not evangelism. It's not witnessing. I'm trying to make my life visible, and that's why I use the stories of my life. My words are meaningless, apart from how I live my life. I know there are limits. How do you make your life visible in a virtual environment? And frankly, here is the dividing line for me between spiritual and religious. Religious gives up trying to use my life as a witness and focuses on the words, the, the beliefs, the teaching. That's a small fraction of what evangelism and witnessing are in my experience. When I returned John's pickup to him, I didn't know what to expect. Okay, was he going to be angry at me? Was he going to shame me for my ignorance and how to care for a four-wheel drive pickup? Okay, would he, would he, how much was it going to cost me to repair his windshield? I was prepared for all of that when I drove his pickup home. I had gotten out my hose and washed all the manure out of the in the bed of the truck. I'd done everything I could to <clears throat> try to make sure that I was not adding insult to injury. Okay. What I wasn't prepared for was John's response. He just got this little smirk on his face and he said, Steve, these things happen. That's what insurance is for. Oh man, I was so relieved, okay? And I went to work the next week and, and, and we worked alongside each other. He never mentioned it again. The cracked windshield, my ignorance. It's one of the beautiful illustrations of grace in my life. And I didn't realize it, what it cost him until several years later when I had to replace a windshield in my car because of gravel regular occurrence out here in the country. You city folks probably don't uh, experience that as much. But I replaced my windshield and the insurance paid for it and the next year my premium went up. And I suddenly realized that the grace that John had extended to me cost him much more than I anticipated. What have you been entrusted with? What are you the steward of? How many cracked windshields are on your hands? What price has that grace come at? Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.